I'm here with Mark Barnes from Timeline Wealth Management and Greenstones Financial Services. Say hello, Mark. Hello. And today we're going to be sharing with you how Greenstones Financial Services has been a success for my accountancy practice and how we work with our relationship and how you can use our ideas to implement and deliver financial services within your practice. Let's get started. So good afternoon. Uh, Mark is here somewhere. If you turn your video on, Mark, that would be great. Uh, today we're going to have, hello, Mark. Uh, today we're going to be having a conversation with Mark about how he works with accountancy firms and in particular with uh, Greenstones and Greenstones Financial Services in order to provide IFA, independent financial advice to our customers and how we work together and how over the years that relationship has developed. As I always say when I begin these conversations, it is the questions that you ask that I believe deliver the most value to the community. So we already have some questions that have been asked as part of the registration process, which we will, of course, answer. But if during the course of today's conversation, there is stuff that comes up for you, some questions that come up for you, then please post them in the Q&A box. It's the little two buttons to the right of the raised hand buttons or pop them in the chat and we will gladly answer them as we go along and as I always say I like stupid questions because stupid questions are easy to answer so if there's a stupid question then please feel free to ask it just don't ask the hard ones because that's not uh, my favorite place to be so without further ado let me introduce you to a young man um called uh, well say young well, I'm not quite <laughs> sure he's as young as what he used to be when we first met but a young man called Mark so Mark can you uh, start by sharing a little bit of your background how did you get started how did you get into IFA land oh god going back many years ago um god started in the early days working for life insurance companies so I used to go around sort of like peoples and ask them for referrals and start from the ground up in the good old days of endowments and all that lot um Fortunately enough, I didn't do many endowments. I managed to avoid most of the mis-selling scandals that went around. Um, I didn't really like doing mortgages, so I kind of helped avoid that world. So I worked in banks and become an independent advisor around about 20 years ago, uh, working in the city, working with a lot of solicitors, barristers and things like that as clients. Uh, and then I just moved on uh, to work myself. So <clears throat> what else do you want to know? <laughs> Thank you. So how, how long ago was it that we first started working together, Mark? Uh, well, we've known each other about 15 years. So when I first got introduced to you from a company when I was working in London, um, I split off with them and set up my own company. Um, we've been working since on that, uh, on an introducer's agreement, which is the most normal route for most accountants who tend to know lays with different financial advisors and have a split of their commission fees and things like that. Uh, we decided to go and run a joint venture oh, quite a few years ago, about five, six years ago that we've done that and um, it's worked ever since. So just to give a little bit of background from a Greenstones perspective, when we met Mark or was first introduced to Mark, we'd got a number of IFAs that we referred business to. Um, and it was nothing more than a, uh, a hello, uh, here's somebody that you need to be speaking to. It was a pretty informal relationship. Um, there was no money exchanging hands. It was all done on the promise of referrals. So if we refer you, then you will obviously refer Greenstones. And we had relationship, I think at the time, there was three different IFAs uh, that we worked with or referred to, depending on uh, the needs of the customers. However, lots of the accountants within the room will know that it is very easy for us as accountants to tee up IFAs and make the referral to the IFA. But what should we say? Very rarely do we get anything back from uh, the IFA. And when we was first introduced to Mark, it was uh, on the basis that that relationship become more formal. And if I remember rightly, Mark, we began that relationship quite loosely and it was uh, it was a referral fee process um, yes. when we made the referral to you. So can you can you remember way back when how that used to work or indeed now that you're working with other accountants on that basis, can you share how that, how that arrangement works? Yeah, certainly. I mean, the way it tends to work is that um, if we sign up a client, um, we earn an initial fee, say, of two or three thousand pounds, as a rough example. Um, we would normally give away 20 to 25% of that as a split, depending on the relationship. 
The issues that always arrived with it is that we'd have to disclose that to the client, the, what we earned, and you as accountants then had to refer tell the client what you earned from us as well as a part of the referral. Um, we had a few instances, and one you'll probably remember, Simon, where one client um, got a bit funny with it, where he thought that I was raising the fees just so I could pay you, um, which then obviously turned a bit sideways with that client. So to try and justify it off, what we did is we set up the joint venture. To set up the joint venture, it made that, that all the fees, all the introductions was passed over to me. It seemed like I was part of Greenstones. Um, as the financial services side of things, but nothing to do with the accountancy part. So it was quite clear when I spoke to the clients, I've nothing to do with the accountants and the financial services, and we work independently um, under regulatory issues and things like that, which most clients do understand and they're quite happy with. The beauty of doing it that way is it allowed us to, when we were talking to the clients, then I'd be declaring the fees, and that was the fees. There was no split back away to the green stones and things like that. So that kind of helped us cement that relationship and it seems seamless and it does, it is seamless as far as clients are concerned. So just, just going back over that from an accountancy point of view, the challenge that we had uh, when we was just doing it on a pure referral basis was that obviously we was introducing somebody from outside of Greenstone. So the brand in effect wasn't carried across. So we was introducing Mark from Timeline and then Mark was coming in and having to reestablish the brand re-establish the relationship in the trust so there was a discord there was a break in it right. and then secondly the thing around uh, declaring the commissions that we receive we have to obviously do the same with regards uh, to declaring that income uh, through the professional regulations that we have and the, the as much as I knew that that I could justify the money that we was receiving because of the work that we was doing. We had a relationship with Mark. We had an ongoing relationship. We were spending time, non-fee earning time with Mark, learning about all the different things that was available that Mark will be sharing uh, with, with us in a little while. And we was also, uh, no disrespect to Mark, because Mark knows this, we was also looking at other IFAs in the market, making sure that Mark was the right person, the right relationship. So, as much as we were receiving a sum of money for a referral, we was also doing lots of work in the background, making sure that we was looking after our customers. And I ethically could then accept that money because of the work that we were doing. So there was a couple of things with that, that we was receiving some money for it, but it was a bit, let's just say it was a bit clunky. And then I discovered that one of the magic things that IFAs have is this thing called trail. And not only did they get the uh, income up front on day one or some of the income up, up, up front on day one, they also then got the trail income. And at that point, we wasn't getting any of that trail. We wasn't participating in any of that trail. And ultimately, that trail uh, generates a capital value. So there is some equity. So we was getting uh, paid the uh, the initial pay away, but we weren't then involved in the ongoing relationship or we wasn't as involved as deeply in the ongoing relationship as what we could be. And also we was missing out on the potential capital value if and when that um, relationship was sold on. So perhaps I've got a couple of questions that have come in already, Mark, but perhaps we could just expand yep. on that for me. You give me the IFA version of that as opposed to the accountancy version of it. And yep. um, perhaps we can then look at some couple of, couple of questions. Okay. Yes, you, you're absolutely correct. I mean, we as an IFA firm, we tend to have a higher value than accountants. Um, yours might be one year's earnings, et cetera, et cetera. Ours is based on a multiple of our recurring fees which can be anywhere between sort of like five to six times whatever the recurring fee is. So the value in financial services is quite high right now because we have got a strong relationship. We do tend to be there beyond the accountancy part as well. So when someone sells up the business and they're retired, they're still coming to us for um, drawdown needs, income needs, et cetera, et cetera, from the portfolio and management of the portfolio. So we are two separate parts of it. We work well together because if I get any tax questions or any tax issues, then it's bounced back to you guys. But yes, so there is a strong value uh, in building up an IFA firm because you're right. It, for us personally, yes, yeah, an IFA firm, we would love people to be on an introducer agreement because all we've got to do is pay that pay away up front in the first year, but we get the ongoing going forward all to ourselves. 
So that allows us to keep a large chunk of the recurring income and the recurring value under our own brand. But we have to look at it, building a relationship with an accountancy practice actually can work really well. Uh, and we see it as two strengths because when we have um, review meetings, then we might I might tag on the end of a yearly review when I mean, we're talking about profits and things like that, and I can just tag in quite nicely. Uh, and also working with accountants, we're also passing the information between each other because we've got an active interest. So again, we're not too worried about the data protection issues and all that. We do follow the guidelines to make sure we're not breaking any trust uh, around that sort of things. But we, the working in tandem is, is the best way. Thank you, Mark. And just just looking, and and I've got your question, your internet connection. <clears throat> you didn't miss anything when it went weird. So I just want to look at the way, or just talk about the way that it's set up. So I, I can talk about the structure that we have, um, but there's obviously some uh, professional or uh, some uh, legislative challenges that your your language would be better than mine at, at sharing that, Mark. So I'll I'll default to you for that. But basically, what we've done is we've created a limited company. And uh, Mark has a shareholding in that company. I have a shareholding in that company. And the way that we've established it at Greenstones is some of the team members also have an interest in that company. So when Greenstones makes a referral to Greenstones Financial Services, Greenstones Financial Services undertakes the work. The money comes into Greenstones Financial Services. Uh, GFSF pays off certain expenditure that it has in connection with that referral. And then the balance of any profits after the corporation tax and all the rest of it are split out to the respective team. Uh, Greenstone's holdings, which is my shareholding or uh, in Mark's case, uh, Mark's holding. So it's, it's basically it's a limited company where the A shares are hold in uh, ratio or in a proportion that equates effectively to um, I want to say the effort that we put in, but no doubt Mark will say that his effort exceeds our effort massively. But that's the that's the way that our contribution is probably an, an interesting way of putting it. So that's the way uh, that the structure works. Just to fill in from a regulatory point of view, we are not Greenstone's Financial Services. Mark, again, correct me if my language is wrong. Greenstone's Financial Services is not directly regulated by no. the FCA, but we we work. I want to use the word uh, umbrella, but how, how does that how does that structure work from a regulatory point of view? Okay, so my main company is Timeline Wealth, um, so we're directly authorised to the FCA, so we report into them. What we've got done underneath it is we've set up um, appointed representatives. So I can have as many appointed representatives as I like underneath my umbrella. So virtually what I do is I wear two different hats. I have the Greenstones hat of the timeline hat. So I can show the business cards to Greenstones, I can show the, um, the business cards to Greenstones and timeline. So it doesn't matter, I'm the same person. But the compliance structure, we have to report in to the FCA of all the different companies underneath us. So it's quite easy because we can control the admin. Our back office system differentiates between Greenstones and Timeline Wealth. So when we do reporting or anything like that, the clients that are under Greenstones are segmented under Greenstones so we can just monitor the whole thing. So it makes it easier from a regulatory point of view if I get a visit from the FCA or whatever and compliance come in and check us quite randomly down again, they're able to see exactly what we're up to with certain clients. They can track it, we can see all the monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of easy because we take away the FCA burden away from the accountants. We know what we're doing. We just got the systems to actually control and manage it anyway. So virtually all it is, is two different names. Timeline, Greenstones, that's all it is. So simply, Greenstones Financial Services and an appointed representative of Timeline Wealth Management, all of the regulatory stuff, the control, the reviews and whatnot are done in Timeline Wealth Management, yes. and the, but the work is effectively done in uh, Greenstones Financial Services. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and just to be clear to everybody that's watching, I am not a qualified IFA. I do not give any IFA advice. Mark, David, Nathan and Nicola at Greenstones, we do not give any financial advice at all. None. All we're doing is passing the lead and then we're having a conversation with Mark. And then Mark is starting or uh, people that work with Mark, Andy and Tom and various other people are then working and following out the relationship. And then you are delivering uh, the advice. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the most important thing is um, you guys know what you're doing as accountants. 
Uh, the last thing I ever want is an accountant crossing over into my world, start trying to sell pensions or life insurance and stuff like that. So we've got quite a clear structure. You pass the name on of what they're interested in. We take it from there. The last thing I ever knew, need you is to say, oh, we can get guaranteed this or guaranteed that because there's no such thing. Um, so we kind of want to differentiate. And that's an important factor whenever we talk to any accountants is really don't get involved. Just find the interest. Let us do the bit, the rest of it. And the ultimately, from a professional indemnity insurance point of view, yep. it's completely separate policy to Greenstones. It's it's basically held by Timeline Wealth Management, and Greenstones Financial Services is under that umbrella. I keep using that word umbrella, but it's covered by the Timeline uh, yes. uh, regulations and the and the P, PII cover. Yes. Thank you. So um, there's a couple, a couple of questions that have come in um, that we'll, we'll ask. Uh, David has asked, do you work with other accountants? So do you work with other accountants other than Greenstones? Yes. So, and, and, and on what basis, Mark? So, but there's if, one if, other as a joint venture, uh, and the rest of them seem to be, we're on early starts of introducer arrangements to possibly run to a JV if they turn over a decent amount. Okay. So if you was... Um, if you was going to begin a new relationship with an accountant, obviously you don't go from sort of, well, I've got, I'm going to, I'll use the word Tinder. You don't go from Tinder to married uh, overnight. So no. th there must be, there must be a process that you go through uh, before you get into bed with somebody like you have done with Greenstones Financial Services. What, so what's the route? What's the recommendation? Generally what we start off with is the introduced arrangement. So as we started off, where there's a percentage split and all that. And what they try to do is we're trying to see how we work together, which is quite key, um, generating, are we making sure we don't upset your clients and we are working as one seamless unit. Um, so we, we kind of start that relationship, to try and get an idea of what business volume is there to see if it's a justifiable thing. If you go into a JV, JV there is costs under our end. So it needs to work. It needs to work from the council point of view. It needs to work, work from us as well. So we, it's making sure there is value in it. And that doesn't happen overnight. So we tend to kind of want to work in that relationship, build it up with a view that potentially we can go there and have a, a business interest together. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and just for Anne, uh, I don't actually know what Tinder is. I've just heard the kids talking about it. So that's <laughs> just to clear that, <laughs> just to clear that one up. Uh, Anne's also asked, um, so basically get the admin right. Do you, do you mind sharing what system you use uh, to, to do the admin? Yes. I mean, we use a system of intelligent office and it's for IFAs. Um, so it's for us and independent. So it kind of attracts what we need to report to people. Uh, we have to, log absolutely everything um, we record our meetings so we use recordable pens videos etc cetera, etc cetera, whenever we speak to a client because it's amazing how many times um, clients actually have short-term memory loss or long-term memory loss and sometimes we have to remind them of what they said um, so we can do, do that we back and we store everything emails communication documents hard facts soft facts everything else that. And we also use different systems as well for like, I'll come on to the cash flow modeling and that, which is a great interest to clients, where it's more interactive between us and the clients. Um, and again, everything is stored. Thank you. Uh, and then Andrew's asked, uh, how do I know that I'm working with a good financial advisor? So we, we could, we can hold that in, in two parts, Mark. O obviously you've got to have some qualifications. Uh, I don't, it, I don't imagine that you just rock up, sit one exam and you're an IFA. Are there different sections of it? How, how, how does the qualification systems work? Yeah, the qualifications, I mean, we, I mean, we tend to stick to uh, the investment protection and pension world. We can do, the nitty gritty sort of like tax plan and stuff like enterprise investment schemes, venture capital trusts and that we can do them uh, as well, but they tend to be on the higher end of clients that understand what they're doing. So we are kind of on a risk control basis with clients. So what we try and do is make sure that we're controlling the risk. None of us want to complain. Um, so we try and do an education process with the client to find out where their comfort zone is and we build it from there. Okay, so and you talked earlier about being directly directly regulated with the IFA. Yeah. I know that there used to be the the man from Prue, for example. Yes. What, what's the what's the difference in 
an, an independent financial advisor and a, a fi- financial advisor that doesn't claim to be independent. Do that? Are they? I think the language once upon a time used to be tied and multi-tied. How does how does that work? Yeah, it's the exact same. So right, what we have now is it's, it's called polarization. So we're independent financial advisors. So we work independently. Um, us as a firm, we don't take commission. Um, we sometimes take it on protection kit plans. They tend to be on fees. The, the beauty of what, what we do as independent advisors is that we, with the fee basis, we can either charge it to them through the product, them personally, or through the business, if, it, if it's a allowable business expense. So we kind of do work like that. We've got a few clients on retainers rather than us taking a percentage of the investment portfolio. So again, that makes it cheaper for them and allows them to offset against some of the tax stuff. Um, maybe some accountants might have some terminology or issues around that side of things, but it tends to work and we tend to get those clients through um, quite easily. The opposite end of the scale is uh, tied advisors. Um, the tied firms that most accounts have come across nowadays is St. James's Place, AJP, SJP, um, where they'll probably say that they're probably more independent than an independent financial advisor, which is not true at all. Um, they are, they are commission-based. So they say that they don't charge any fees up front, et cetera, et cetera. No, what they do is they lock a client in for six years. So they cannot, they cannot sort of like research a market like us. When they're seeing a client, they've got a view of actually moving whatever they have into an SJP product. We don't have to. If, if a client's got a workplace pension and we think it's the best place to put their pensions to consolidate, we'll tell them to do that and we can charge them a fee. So we, have, we actively work in the interest of the client rather than actually trying to sell a product to ourselves. So we've got lots of clients. I did one recently where I was recommending virtually cash accounts like um, premium bonds and all those sorts of things with the low interest rates and negative interest rates right now. Um, we tend to do that. Uh, also, we do tend to find with us, is we're a bit more honest with the returns. Um, or what people can achieve. So again, if someone's defensive, what are they expecting? If someone's adventurous, what are they expecting? It's understanding that risk. Um, And because we're independent, we can go anywhere. We can actually go to any of the fund managers, any of the pension providers. We can keep it. We can be cheap and cheerful and follow trackers, or we can go full active and get the best fund managers out there. So it all boils down to clients' perception of what they're willing to pay. Um, right now, if people with the world has gone a bit chaotic, we find that the value portfolios are doing the best rather than passive tracker funds. Um, if you're in the UK index right now, you probably would have lost about 20% of your portfolio this year. My clients are all active, are all plus territory or flat. And that's in a crazy world. Okay, so so the first part of that answer to that question is to make sure that they're fully independent and they're not tied in right. any way or promoting their own uh, own products. Um, and then there's the second part of that question. If we if we think about the soft skills, what what sort of things do you think you should have as an IFA when you're working with accountants? Um, listening um, is normally a good one, um, and writing down what actually motivates that client. Um, we do tend to find that because we're dealing with business owners, why have they gone into business? Um, one could be freedom, two for money, two for a future value. Uh, and we kind of say, All right, okay, well, finding the motivation in individual clients, what they like and what they don't like is, is so, so important. And that's where you have to take it away from being independent. It's actually what are they after? Um, and taking advantage of what they've actually got They've got things, they've paid fees, costs, or whatever to get it set up. You need to make sure it's still fit for purpose. If it's not, then you've got to make the move. If you're going to move it, there has to be a good reason why. Brilliant. Thank you. And then just, just to fill in from an accountancy point of view, Andrew, what we've found over the years um, is that there is less, uh, what should I say, there's less urgency from an IFA point of view as far as customers are concerned. So Within our world, because they've got deadlines for corporation tax returns and accounts and all the rest of it, there's a hard stop. Whereas when you're talking about pensions and investments, it's very easy to think a bit like wills. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. And 
invariably if you're not careful and this is where the close working relationship comes in and to make sure it's monitored and andy at mark's place is brilliant at this is making sure that the referrals um and the correspondence then doesn't slip through the gap because um and again our relationship greenstone's relationship with a customer I feel is stronger. And I think you can perhaps accept this certainly at the start, Mark, our relationship is far stronger with the customer. And it, and if we ring and say, look, you really need to sort this out. It very often saves Mark or Andy ringing up half a dozen times because our, as I say, the trust that we've got in the relationship or the, uh, the power or authority, I think perhaps that we've got in the relationship is stronger. So um, definitely uh, the ability to chase monitor and that open dialogue backwards and forwards, Andrew, is uh, very important to us. So just to go back, David's asked a supplementary question about uh, working with other accountants. Uh, the simple answer to that, David, is no. Um, they, don't, they don't work under the Greenstones brand. So just to give clarity around that market and correct me if I'm wrong, step one is for you to have a conversation and basically set up an introducer's arrangement. Once you've got so there's a, a sufficient amount of work being passed backwards and forwards, then you would move on to a uh, you would move on to a JV arrangement, and at that point you would create the brand and whatnot because you would then know that a they would earn more money out of it than the referral, and b you would get more money out of it than making the referral. Yeah. So that there's the sum of the two, the synergy in the two is greater than just a basic introducer agreement. Is that right? Correct. I mean, I've got to say with the Greenstones one. Uh, I find there's more value, there's more active interest from the accountancy point of view of making it work uh, rather than just passing on a lead because you'll be more interested as an accountant doing your work, um, doing the accountancy practice. So I've, it, we've worked harder and we generate more income under the JV than we have in the introducers agreement because we are part of your business. So that to me is an important factor. Thank you. And just, just to give a, a, a throw away, which is, for, for me is very important. Basically, we ask one question of our customers. And that question is, have you seen an IFA in the last 12 months? And if they haven't, then we say that they, they really should be and they should be speaking to Mark. Or if they've got their own IFA, why have they not spoken to their own IFA in the last 12 months? And it challenges that relationship because for us, and I, I, I truly believe this is going to become more and more and more important. And again, Mark's going to share some stuff with us in a minute around how he's working with the customers, how the IFA and accountant relationship are so in synergy, especially when you start talking about longer term planning and pensions and retirements and succession planning uh, and all that sort of stuff. So that's the answer to that one question, uh, uh, David. John has asked, does Mark have to have or own a certain percentage of the JV for regulatory purposes? Yes. And, and um, what's that percentage, Mark? It's John, well, generally it can vary depending on the level of income, but we would probably want say 55% roughly is a minimum um, because the risk is with me as a firm. This risk is actually with me. So I kind of, I've got more risk in the accountancy part. So I obviously want a majority of it. Uh, thank you. Uh, and then Neil's asked a supplementary question about SJP. Uh -huh. um, and I, I don't necessarily get into the specifics of it because uh, I've got some fairly strong uh, opinions on that uh, as well. But um uh, Neil says SJP will say they can get better returns. Is that right? No, it's complete lies. So the SJP, um, they've got their own panel of funds and their own kind of funds within it. But whenever we've done an analysis on any SJP client, um, we, we are so much cheaper and produce better returns, virtually 100%. It boils down to the risk. And um, what we do tend to find with a lot of SJP clients, they do not know the risk um, of where they are because they're trying to maximize the returns, but not actually fulfill where the client is. So if you have a downturn in the market, that's where the issues will come into play quite a lot of time. And also they cannot access the funds as well for six years. So they need to remember that. Thank you. Uh, then Richard asked, uh, so for basic tax planning for individual directors to extract profit from their limited company, is that financial advice? Should the stipulation be that we do not provide financial advice? Well, I don't know where I want to get into the specifics of the, the way the, the, the regulation works, Richard, but advising a, a, a customer on their tax planning is tax planning advice. As soon as you start talking about, and I'm, I'm going to use a word now, regulated products, 
then that's where we get into financial. So as soon as we start talking about insurance, pensions, investment, ISAs, and all of that sort of stuff, that's that's where it becomes financial advice. Is that correct, Mark? Right. Yes. You need to be careful about what you say. You can create an interest. Most people with the currencies, when they're asking that, the interest might be, well, I don't know about these pensions. I might want to consolidate it or... We say, we'll just get a review, have a look at it. Or I've got all this money sitting in my account. What do I do with it? Uh, and that's general when we say pass it on. Yeah. So we, I believe, and as I say earlier, we, we don't do any advice at all. We just pass them over to Mark and then we, we leave it. We have a regulation. I think it's called a DPB registration with the ACCA that allows us to comment on professional advice. So give an opinion. Um, but it doesn't allow us to advise on whether it's good or bad and uh, and that sort of stuff. But we we just it's a minefield for me, and I don't I don't want to get anywhere near that. Um, and that's why it goes over to uh, to Mark. Uh, so uh, Neil has asked. Uh, I really struggle to get buy in from clients to speak to an IFA. Any suggestions? Well, we're going to come up with three. Uh, things in a minute that you might start a conversation Neil. but simply that question have you seen an ifa in the last 12 months we believe it's really important i have an excellent ifa that i use and therefore i believe that you should be having that conversation with them as well uh, another really good way of doing it neil is to go into the meeting with them so you and the IFA go in. I know lots of clients find IFAs a little bit scary. They think they're going to be sold a pension and that sort of uh, that sort of stuff. So hold their hand as much as uh, uh, as much as possible and escort them and support them through uh, the process. Andrew's asked, Mark. So at what value does it become worthwhile to set up a JV? So and it's perhaps a bit difficult to answer because of all the different products that that make that up, but if, if you had to set a time scale for, say, a practice that's turning over, well, it's perhaps got, say, 200 clients, perhaps turning over half a million pound, 400,000 pounds. Do you have an idea if the relationship is a, is a strong relationship, how long it would take to go from introducer to JV? Is it possible to come up with that? It's a tough one. Um, it, it really is where the value is in those clients. So it could be if you're dealing with, I don't know, lower end firms and things like that who do not have a lot of money that's to make ends meet and that's why they work, that's why they're self-employed or have a business. They may struggle to find the value in those clients, although we do believe in trying to make sure that every client gets service one way or another. Um, we're quite keen on actually getting financial services out there, quite keen on getting help out there, really, uh, to some clients. There is value in every single client as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it's just making sure, finding out where that value is and where they can assist. So we have got clients where we might just charge a flat fee of 500 quid, but we help them out. Uh, and we're the, one of the first people to come back to. So we've had that quite a few times where we've, sometimes we've just helped them out with a quick query or a quick inquiry and sent or point them in the right direction. But they can guarantee you can always come back. We had one instance, again, no client of Greenstone's, just researching the place, phoned up. Um, I had a few questions around uh, an annuity that he had to take. Um, it was a guaranteed annuity, so I wasn't going to move it. Um, he had to take it. So all I did is I pointed him in the right direction on what he needed to do with that company. I couldn't move it, so I needed to help him. So I helped him. Lo and behold, his two sons become clients. So it's just helping clients. You don't know what's come around. You know of a certain client, Simon, where you just didn't think there was anything in it and there was a lot in it. So um, we can deal with those types of clients no matter what. Let us see where the value is. And that client wasn't actually the one that we got earned money out of. All. It was his mum. We helped him. And then eventually we got his mum as a client and we earned quite a lot out of it. So this, we don't know. You don't know. We don't know. No, but just, just going back to Andrew's question, it... it is, is there a minimum level of fee income that you would have to have, do you think? Or, or would you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, whether it's predominantly funds under management or pensions or relevant uh, life policies? Or yeah, to answer that question quickly, or answer, I would probably see that we need to try to generate at least 60 grand a year to make it work. So you'd be, you'd be looking at a pay away of at least five grand a month, so 60 grand. So gross on that would be... Uh, my maths needs to be worked out about, about quarter of a million pound gross in order for that to, to work uh, to, to both people's advantage? Or is that 60 grand gross? I said 60 grand gross to try and generate the income. 
So it's as long as it's generating some income towards us, that's all that matters. But realistically, to make it probably work, ideally, you need to be over 100. But as a start, I would be looking around that to build it. So if, you, if you've got payaways under the traditional model at 25%, if you've got payaways in the region of 15 to 25, yep. then it's at that sort of point where you should be sort of perhaps right. looking to, to invest further in the relationship. Okay. Right. Yes. Um, and then I've just, whilst I've been, been talking about Andrew's challenge, Neil, I just had another idea. Uh, one of the things to build a relationship is for you to build a relationship with the IFA. And it's no good just having ad hoc conversations if you book a diary for, for once a month, once every other month to sit down, have a bite to eat, uh, Mark will ply you with red wine and whiskey and all the other stuff. Not, it's not whiskey, it's bourbon, isn't it? You are. But Bourbon. anyway. It's, no fashion. Uh, that's right. And, and, build that re- uh, and build that relationship. That's another good way of, of, of making it work. So uh, Suneth has asked, uh, Mark, how much do you charge? Uh, as I just said, I could, some clients would be five hundred pounds. Um, some people, it, it, it could be ten thousand um, pounds. Most of our clients, a hundred thousand. So it's it, it varies. Uh, it can be a percentage. Um, if it, it depends how hard and difficult it is. If it's a pension transfer, generally we charge at least three percent, um, but we cap it so we can cap the charges as well. Um, but that's moving transfers and stuff and that. There's a lot of regulatory costs to that. Um, if it's just simple, somebody's got a couple hundred grand they want to invest, pure cash into a portfolio, something's been just charged one to one and a half percent. So it, it depends. Thank you. Uh, and then Tony's asked, um, has, has, he has an excellent relationship with an IFA that produces a healthy and steady income stream, but previous discussions with them regarding sharing capital value of the clients have referred has always been a stumbling block. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how you could achieve that? <laughs> well, this is what I was on about with the JV. So I take it it's not a joint venture arrangement then? Uh, no, it doesn't sound like one. It sounds like he's getting um, a, a, the referral fee and that's it. Right. And which is what you talked about at the beginning. Yeah, and my, my second thing with that, Tony, is uh, if you think back to the Malcolm Smith uh, presentation that we had, uh, the person that's strongest in any negotiation is the person with the best plan B. Uh, and I, I would potentially argue you don't have a plan B at the moment because all your eggs are in one basket. So you might want to have a think about how you could, uh, how you could work uh, that. Um, Anne has put, uh, not true, there is a 5th of April deadline for pension contributions. Yeah, there is. Okay, I, so that, that's the one that, uh, and no doubt there's a capital gains tax one and all sorts of different things. So uh, that's referring back to Mark the fact that I said there was no hard deadlines in the IFA. Uh, in the no, IFA there isn't. It's great on the pension contributions, although we can carry back. So we carry forward the previous three years. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, and then Ashley's asked uh, my internet cut off a couple of minutes ago. Is already answered. The qualified I qualified as an IFA a few years ago myself and began working with a local financial services firm. My idea was that I put my so that my idea was that I myself would be dual qualified. I lasted two weeks with the firm because I found out the manager was dodgy and being investigated due to fitting practice. He still continued with the firm without telling the FCA and got the owner uh, signed off. So that's another option then, Mark, other than working for a dodgy boss. So how long a process do you, does it is it does it take to become an IFA? Could I qualify as an IFA? Yeah, you could. Um, so the, if anyone wants to be a financial advisor, but you need to be monitored. So it's a matter of the monitoring, who's going to monitor you, who's going to sign you off. The FCA are not keen on taking anybody on right now. Um, so the, it's a really, really tough process to actually get it directly authorised. Most common route is people to go into networks. So if that person's qualified as a financial advisor years ago, the best route would probably be to join a network um, where they'll take a percentage away from it and they'll do a large chunk of the compliance. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeff has asked, uh, do you have any geographical limitations on uh, where you work? No, actually, um, thanks to this world of COVID, um, it's actually increased my business uh, on a lot of things because this, being able to see people online do that. So last week I had a client in Vietnam, afternoon Glasgow, um, and later on that was in London. So... I can do it. I've travelled up to Aberdeen. Um, I've, I've gone different places to see clients. If there's value in it, we'll be there. Um, so geographically, a lot of this stuff 
um, it's done remotely anyway. So when we're doing these Zoom calls, and I do prefer to see them face to face because I just kind of like that interaction. But this this helps. Um, I was speaking to a colleague, Tom, the other day, and I said, when was the actual last time you filled in an application form with a client? And we struggled to find the answer. Um, so I've, I can't remember. Everything's done virtually remotely and online anyway. So why not speak to them online? Brilliant. So we, we've got lots lots more questions coming in, Mark, but I know I, I, know I want to give you a little bit of time just to give you uh, or enable you to share with uh, the community, the things that you could be doing, perhaps that they're not thinking about. And, and obviously, number one is not pensions. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I'm not going to be a pension salesman. And I'm, I'm not quite keen on actually, when you talk about pensions, you want to make sure that when you're talking about them, uh, it's, it's in the right format and it is in the right basis. So what we'll do is I'll share the screen with the sort of things that we're doing nowadays with clients, which we've been doing quite a while, and it's very, very successful and where we can actually interact with the clients. So if I can just share my screen now, just bear with me. Hopefully this will work. Can you all see it? Not yet. Oh, oh now we can. Yep, yeah, perfect. Yeah. So let's talk about... Um, Made up an example client here. So this is what we use in cash flow modeling. Cash flow modeling allows us to talk about where they are and what they want to achieve. So if we've got a client here, plan of retire at 67, what am I going to get and can I afford to retire? Currently, he has 30,000 pounds in a small pension, 50 grand in an ISA, cautious portfolio. So what we tend to do with these is we talk about, well, what is their plans? So you start with, okay, we can afford a thousand pounds a month from the business. So he'll contribute a thousand pounds a month from his business um, and he's still got his investments. He's got a plan of having a world cruise when he retires um, of 30,000 pounds in today's money. So what we do with these clients is we say, right, what money comes in and what money is going to come in in the future and what you're expecting to come into the future. So we then go through their expenses. So affordability. The great thing about this when we're doing this with a client is we can see have they got any other policies elsewhere? Have they got any life cover? Have they got any critical illnesses? Um, things that they might be wasting the money. We have a lot of clients that have a lot of old plans. And when they have a lot of old plans, they sometimes forget what actually what they're for. And they're so used to direct debits that they just don't question what they're actually spending the money on. So this is a good tool to kind of sort of like challenge them on what are they trying to achieve and what they're spending the money on each year. So this, by that, it gives us a good gauge of that client and their interaction, what motivates them, what doesn't motivate them. And generally what we do is we come to this and we're able to see virtually their incomes and their outgoings and what their planned expenditure is. So this is a line of their expenditure. And you can see their retirement. And you can see how it's going to be made up with all the different things like on their salaries, their pensions, their, all kinds of different things. And this is their income as they're building it. And then we can show, right, what's their savings going to be like over time. So we do this planning of building in their ISAs, what it's going to be worth once they start drawing down, how that's going to be, their pension, what's it, should it be worth, uh, and their ISAs. And virtually we can build in different things at events. So at retirement, they might want to, I don't know, they might have finished kids at college at the age of 53 or 51. And what we'll do is they say, right, you're gonna have more spare income coming in. So we just build in this. So the great thing here is that we can say, what is the, the value going to be when they hit retirement? So we can see here, this one we're using so that they, they don't get anything from their business at all. They just draw on it and it doesn't have a capital value at the end. We've done one where we've got somebody who will have a capital value at the end. So they'll sell a business and it'd be worth, say, £30,000. We can build in all kinds of different things there. If they've got rental income coming in, they've got a buy-to-let portfolio. If they've got assets, we want to know what those assets are. And it's important about how they're going to draw down with it. So when I'm talking about people with pensions, they might have other income coming in from other sources. They might have a trust fund. They might inherit a lot of money. We just talk about where is the money going to come in and what impact is it going to have when they actually draw down? So what does their retirement look like when they hit retirement? So this uh, client here, sorry, he's not having the mouse. 
Um, you can see here, there's a big lump of money that's coming from the sale of a business. And again, that just allows, when you go down to the next slide, that it just allows these funds are going to be better. And when we go through and through retirement, we can base it down, drawing down it, how long is that money going to last? So we can see the lump sum coming in. And then you can see down here on the slides what it should be worth and how he's drawn down. So this client has a um, total income coming of 27,200, state pensions, et cetera, et cetera. And he, but he's wanting just over uh, three grand a month, two and a half grand a month. And you can see that there's a shortfall. So we just build that in and that just draws down from the portfolio. So they're quite keen on the cash flow model because we will build whatever they want around their lives. Again, if they've got different things, we can build it in. So this is the beauty of us being independent financial advisors. We're there as consultants. We're there talking about what they're actually after, what they're trying to achieve from their businesses, all their assets, and what they may or not achieve in the future. And obviously, it allows us, if they've got these plans, we talk about protection. Well, what if something goes wrong? What if you get ill, et cetera, et cetera? We build in those contingency plans as well. So the, the protection as well, so which builds us on to the next part, which is on the relevant life. This is a, not, a nice, easy one for an, uh, an accountant to refer. And this is relevant life plans. Virtually what they are is death and service schemes for directors or key people in the firm. So it allows them to have a life cover. So generally, if someone's got a life cover and it's costing them a thousand pounds a year personally, well, if they're drawing that out of the business, then you know that they've got that you're using up some of their allowable income. So by doing this way, and we run it through the company, our relevant life policy is a tax efficient uh, life cover plan. So virtually what it is, is it attracts corporation tax relief on it. And um, the benefits from the life cover is paid free of inheritance tax, et cetera, et cetera. And it's paid straight out to them. And because it's under a kind of life cover plan arrangement, it doesn't have to wait for probate, et cetera, et cetera. It just pays directly to that client. So again, these are really, really useful things when we talk to clients. So we, when we're speaking to a lot of clients, we say, well, right, what life cover have you got? And they might have, I don't know, big outgoings, mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. And, but they might only have a couple hundred grand worth of life cover. And we're like, but you've got a business that's worth quite a bit. You've got um, all other assets and goals and your outgoings are quite a bit. So generally when we're finding people and we're talking about relevant life plans and they're talking about the company paying for it, we've increased the cover. I mean, there's no unknown to us to add. I mean, the, the most we've done for a client is 5 million. So we insured them for 5 million. And we got a nice, pretty fee out of that one as well. So there was good income out of it as well. But generally, most clients will do half a million plus. Um, so they'll actually question the life cover. And when us as advisors, we're really good at saying, I don't think that's enough. So when we're talking to clients and they might only have a couple hundred grand and I'm looking at married with three children, I'm saying, I know for a fact that's not going to last. So it's, I think it's an important thing for me to make sure, look, you pass away, what do you want me to be telling your wife that you only had a couple hundred grand worth of life cover? And, she, and she's gone, oh, that's not going to last. Um, and that's important. So I think when we're talking about life cover, it's something that we're quite keen on. And I will come back to stop sharing. This. Brilliant, Mark. Thank you. So the, the, the two things there for me, the, the first one around the cash flow forecasting is fundamental. So it opens up conversations with uh, customers around business valuations, retirement plans, the income that they've got, what profits they need to create, what savings they've got, their personal balance sheets. And that relationship for me is fundamentally where a good IFA delivers the value. They don't just rock up and sell a mortgage and the associated life insurance that goes along with a mortgage It's or a pension or, or whatever it is. It's that relationship for me that's fundamental. And as I said uh, a little while ago, I think over the over the next few years, that, that's going to become more and more uh, fundamental in the relationship that the accountant and the IFA and ultimately the solicitor as well has within the uh, relationship with the client. So just for clarity on that relevant life policy, Mark, the, a relevant life policy enables a company to pay a life policy and get corporation tax relief on it. Yes. But if and when the uh, owner of that life policy or the director of that business dies, the money is then tax-free and goes to the loved one or whoever it is that they've left the money to. 
Correct. Yes. And normally, historically, before relevant life policies were uh, available, people would have that in their own name and they'd be paying it out of after-tax income yes. um, rather than pre, pre-tax income. Yeah. And also what happens with a lot of people when they take life cover out is... They take out life cover, but they die, and then it falls inside their estate because they've not written into a trust arrangement or anything like that. So this doesn't have a complicated trust. It's very, very simple. It's an expression of wishes. So it uses the exact same rules as pensions. So it doesn't have to wait for probate, et cetera, et cetera. So the amount of times I see people with life cover, they die. Well, it's no benefit to them because they're dead. So they, But they're leaving it in their estate because they just said, if I die... I want half a million pounds to come into my estate. But then all of a sudden that creates inheritance tax issues. So it's amazing how many people have got life cover set up so badly. Um, I always want to review it. Thank you. That's a really easy in uh, uh, as well as Mark said. So uh, we've got 10 minutes to go. Um, I've got, we've got some more questions. If anybody else has got any questions, I'll get them in the Q&A box now and I'll, I'll do my best to get them answered before we finish off at two o'clock. If anybody wants to have a conversation with you, Mark, about how they might work with you or how they might improve the relationship that they've got with their IFA, how, how would they get in touch, Mark? What's the best way for them to get in touch? The best way to get in touch is an uh, email or a phone call. Um, no doubt you'll pass on my details with can do, but it's yeah, it's a email, it's always a good one or a phone call, and we, we can talk that way. I'm always open to having these online meetings and talk to them if they don't want to speak me face to face. In the ideal world, yes, let's meet up, sit in a restaurant, eat, drink, whatever somebody wants. Um, because I feel that kind of I, I get to know them as well, and hopefully they'll get to know me a bit better as well. That I'm not just a drunken Scotsman, but kind of get the um relationship is so so important making sure that we can work together i feel that when we've had a good night out many times with the green stones guys so, so we kind of we all know how each other's work i know how they work um what yeah it just works so i'd rather see people rather than this when you're building a business relationship is very very much so so and and mark the other mark that's uh, in my life at the moment has uh, just popped mark's email address it's mark at greenstonesfs.co.uk uh, in the chat box so if anybody wants to get in touch with mark barnes uh, then uh, please email mark and he'll gladly do it uh, have that conversation and this and the same with me if anybody's got any conversate any questions that they would like to ask per- privately then just whatsapp me or facebook message or linkedin or whatever and i will gladly answer them so uh, Ashley's asked another question, Mark, around uh, the potential liability. Um, so if if Ashley links with an IFA, is the risk, is there any risk for her or is all of the risk with the IFA? The risk is with the financial advisor. The only risk it could maybe be with the accountant if they've emailed them personally, telling them, giving them financial advice. That, that's, just don't do it. Just pass the name over and let us do it. And away they go. So that just to follow up with Richard's question, uh, Richard was the, the gentleman that asked earlier about where does accountancy advice and, uh, and IFA advice uh, cross over. So your specific Rich, Richard has asked about if we're talking about pensions, where what is permissible and not permissible. So my understanding from an accountancy point of view is we can talk about pensions. We can talk about the, the tax saving possibilities of pensions. We can talk about pension uh, reliefs and how you can carry them back and net relevant earnings and all that sort of stuff. Right. But as soon as we get to the point where they say, yes, we want to do a pension, we then have to, to be quiet and we certainly can't recommend funds or pension providers or anything like that. That's a pass to Mark uh, or whoever. Uh, and Mark has that conversation. Is that right? Very correct. I mean, the most common one that sometimes where accountants make sort of like try and trips into us is uh, when it comes to commercial property. So if somebody's got commercial premises and they're paying rent into that, uh, and they say, well, why don't you use a pension to do it? Because they understand the basics. And then all of a sudden, uh, we're getting the client saying, no, I want to buy this property from a business. And I'm like, well, okay, let's, we have to rewind that, uh, make sure it fits the purpose and it's the right thing. So it's sometimes the conversations can go a bit too far and we just have to say, well, hold on, we need to make sure it's the right thing. So sometimes we would just prefer create the interest, let us do the rest. Yeah, and the, the, the tax implications of transferring that building over into the pension fund, that's all, that's all the accountant's side of it. 
but the actual mechanics of it and then delivering it is the, is the IFA. So uh, David's then asked, uh, what percentage of income do you typically spend on marketing or do you rely entirely on clients from the accounting side? Um, well, I've got my other stuff, which I work on myself. But the accountants, when I've got a joint venture with an accountancy, then I'll be working with the accountancy practice and how we're going to generate it. What sort of clients should we be looking at? Um, where we've sat and gone through the client bank, the accountancy client bank, and trying to discuss, all right, after our discussion, who do you think might be interested? Um, you know, that's, I mean, that, that tends to be the best way is, like you say, you ask about the pensions, you ask if you've got life cover, you ask those sorts of questions. Um, so from a accountancy practice, I find I think it's very easy for you guys to pass on referrals to us. And they tend to be when they come across, they tend to go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so we've got a couple, couple more questions. Um, I'm about to wrap up. We're nearly at the time. So if anybody's got any other questions, then whack them in the Q&A box, um, PDQ. Uh, Andrew has asked, if I build a relationship resulting in payaways of 25000 what's the incentive for the IFA to share? Can you repeat that one again so I can get so, it? And I, I can answer it if... But Andrew said, if the, if you build a relationship resulting in payaways of 25 grand, what's the incentive for the IFA to share? So what's the incentive for the IFA to go further? It's to try and generate more. Uh, that, that's generally what we want to have, because if you can generate 25 grand worth of payaways, then there's a good revenue there. So why would I want to make, for me as an IFA, I'd want it tied up. I wouldn't want another IFA walking in through the door. Uh, if I've got the JV there and it's all set up, and that kind of shuts the door. Um, so to me, I've got an active business interest of developing it, making sure it grows and making sure nobody else is in. So if I, if I go back to my wedding analogy, Andrew, it's a bit like going from being engaged to being married. So, um, and I would also add into that from an accountancy point of view, if you're generating 25 grand on a pay away, so referrals, um, by getting into bed with each other and doing a proper JV, it makes the referral so much easier because there's a synergy and there's the connection between the two and therefore they're much more likely to convert. They're much more likely to be looked after. It's much more efficient from a relationship aspect rather than having to refer to an outside organization. So I, I think the JV is a win-win from all directions, including uh, the customer who gets a, gets a more seamless uh, experience. So there's a couple of reasons there. Uh, John has asked, um, what's Mark's appetite or thoughts on pension transfers? Uh, only on the right basis. So we do consolidation quite a lot. We find that a lot of people they all have the old style pensions. And when people hit retirement nowadays, they don't want an annuity. So they want to draw down on it, want it carried on being invested. So the older ones have to be moved. So if somebody wants to do draw down and or have the pension there as a pot so they can just draw down what they need each year, they have to move it. If they're going to take out an annuity, stay where they are. We have to look out for guaranteed ones as well. So I don't want to move anyone that's got a guaranteed annuity. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and then the last is an observation for a man who's been uh, teeing me up with some questions all the way through and, and says it sounds like mark is a polygamist i don't know i don't know what that word means i need to go and google. look it up in a minute <laughs> i'm gonna go go and google that so i'm gonna take that as a compliment mark <laughs> oh more than one wife it's it, apparently it's, it's, it means that you've got more than one wife and uh, who knows where a relationship might go mark now i've uh, seeded the uh, the thoughts in your head i know alison mark's wife was moving around in the background when we was doing the tests earlier so she's been banished to the bathroom or wherever it is so she uh, so she doesn't oh and, and, and now anne's got you married off to lots of other accountants so it's not only me i've got competition for it i've got competition for it as well so that's brilliant is there anything else mark before we uh, before we disappear is there anything else that you would like to share obviously as i've said uh, the email addresses and the contact details are in the chat box if anybody else would like to uh, take the relationship on a little bit further with mark but is there anything else mark that you'd like to share before we go well i, I always like to help um, so if there's any accountants out there and they've got simple questions, and I get this a lot, they have questions and, that, and they don't know where to ask, 
help, yeah, come to me. I'll quite I'll happily answer any questions. Um, if you've got a scenario and you're thinking, am I doing it right? Or what should I be thinking? Even if you've got an IFA, it doesn't matter. I mean, I work sometimes with other advisors where they can't cover off what I do. So uh, always glad to help, always happy to answer anything. So give us a mind. Get in touch. Brilliant. So just to say uh, thank you very much to everybody that's in the community that's come along uh, and listened to us today. I hope you've got a uh, huge value from it. Thank you for everybody that has asked questions and uh, for commenting. And of course, Matt, thank you very much today for giving up your time and for sharing uh, with the community. So as always, I'm going to finish with a virtual round of applause. <laughs> And the uh, guaranteed uh, virtual uh, wave goodbye. Thank you, Mark. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Uh, bye. Thank you so much for watching this video of me talking to Mark Barnes about Greenstone's financial services and about how you might improve the financial servicing offering and relationship that you have within your practice as always please remember to like this video if you have any comments or questions please post them in the comments below this video and also subscribe to the channel so you get notified whenever i issue or publish any new videos you should see on your screen now two boxes, one this side and one this side that links to more videos in my collection. And I would be delighted if you would follow on and watch the next available videos.